All right, in this video, uh, we're going to go ahead and learn the first type of volume that we're going to see, and this is going to be volume by, uh, by cross-sections. And so this is a little bit probably tricky to visualize. Most of the volume stuff is. Uh, if you need to tinker around and go like look up some YouTube videos, I'm sure there's probably some, some good ones out there that you can use to help yourself kind of conceptually see what's going on. Uh, if you're with me in class, we'll do something in Desmos to kind of help us uh, but just for the sake of the video not being super long, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but just know if, you, if you're struggling conceptually with it, you probably need to watch a video that's that's more visual because once you can kind of see what happens, uh, these these volume questions today with the cross sections and then the next time with the washers and the discs and then the time after with the shells, really all of it is it's kind of strange to do and, and it's kind of tough to picture in your brain without having seen some type of visual first. Uh, so if you need to go look at those visuals, I'm not gonna put them in these videos. I'll go through them with you in class, uh, but if, if you miss class and if you're having to watch the videos, you may you may wanna go just go to Desmos and search for like, hey, cross-sectional volume calculus or, uh, uh, or any other thing that you could do to probably help yourself uh, see a little visualization. YouTube, Khan Academy, uh, Desmos, there's probably lots of stuff out there. But in general today that we're gonna, what we're gonna do, is, is we're going to take these regions that are in the XY plane and then they're going to be like our floor, like the foundation of uh, a house or of a building. And we're going to build straight up out of that floor. We're going to build straight up out of our region. We're going to build it in such a way that each cross-sectional uh, slice, that means like if I were to like take a, take a knife and then cut that 3D figure uh, and then show you kind of the face that, that I just cut along, that cross-sectional is going to fit a specific shape. And it's going to be different on each question. It's going to tell you what type of cross-sectional shape. But the general idea for all of these, uh, if I want to find the volume of these solids formed with the flat base, but made by having these perpendicular cross-sections, uh, the, the idea is going to be, okay, if I want the volume, I need to integrate the area. Okay, Each one of these little slices, uh, we could think about it quickly like like this, That's, that looks like it's a square cross-sectional slice. Uh, if I could find the area of that square, right, that would be like that two-dimensional area, but technically, technically that slice isn't just 2D. It's got that little tiny thickness, and for us the tiny thickness is going to be dx for a dx integration, or it could be dy for dy integration. And so what I'm going to need is to find the area of one of those cross-sectional slices. Then I'm going to multiply that area by dx, uh, or, or if it's a dy integration, I'll multiply that area by dy. And then I would need to somehow compile all of those cross-sectional slices together, like starting with that first one over here on the left, then that next one, and then that next one. And you'd have to, come, uh, you'd have to somehow get them all, uh, all the way over to this last one. Uh, which that's terrible, come on smart board, uh, over there on the right side. So for a dx integration, again, we'll be integrating from left to right. For a dy integration, we would be doing from the bottom to the top, just like we saw with the area. But, but generally, the calculus idea is if I want to find the volume, I'm going to integrate the area. Okay, and we'll kind of just highlight this just really quickly. Again, this right here, that's two-dimensional. Right, so area is two-dimensional, but when you have this, right, the two-dimensional area times that little, tiny, infinitely thin thickness, now that's three-dimensional. Remember, the area is 2D, and then that extra DX, that's like the little width. It's like a piece of paper. You definitely know paper has area, but technically a piece of paper has volume also. It's just that, that third dimension, the thickness of it is so small you don't typically notice it. But if I were to take stack, uh, pieces of paper and stack them together, five pieces of paper, a uh, hundred pieces of paper, like 500 in a typical ream of paper, like that, those individual pieces seem negligibly thin all by themselves. But when I start to accumulate them, I can see that more significant third dimension starting to appear. So each one of these slices is going to seem like it's just to the and so we're going to treat it basically just like the area, but technically the third dimension is that really infinitely thin uh, width, which is either the dx or the dy. Right? So a, the area uh, is 2D, but then the dx is the third dimension, or a of y, that's just the area formula, but in terms of y, 
and then times dy. Uh, but we find the area, we tack on the differential. That's our three-dimensional volume. Remember, area times that thickness. That's the, that's the three-dimensional volume. And then the integration symbol, remember, means you're adding infinitely many things together. You're compiling all of those volumes from all of those little slices, starting with the first one on the left, going to the last one on the right. That is how we would go through and do area in terms of, or this volume in terms of dx. Integrate the area to get the volume. Right? That's kind of the big takeaway. Now, if it's a dy integration, instead of doing, right, dx is left to right, dy integration is going to be the bottom, which is typically c, up to the top. So if we're doing a dy integration, uh, that means everything is going to be perpendicular to the y-axis, perpendicular to the x, that means dx. Uh, but if we're doing a dy integration, and that's y equals c, and that's y equals d, you have y values, that's the bottom integrating up to the top. The thing that we integrate, that area formula, has to be defined by the variable y, and then of course it's got a dy. Okay, so integrate the area to get the volume. That's pretty much the big idea behind today's lesson and really the next couple of lessons. But just visualizing it is usually going to be kind of the, the hardest part. But here's kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, kind of, I guess, process that I kind of lay out for you. How do I go about thinking and attacking one of these cross-sectional questions? Well, first thing I do is I read the question and I determine, does it want me to do dx or does it want me to do dy? We're not really going to have a choice. It's going to tell you either perpendicular to x, which means dx, because they're going to be vertical slices, and each one's infinitely thin. Perpendicular to x means dx. Perpendicular to y means dy. Right? So it's going to tell you which axis those cross-sectional slices are perpendicular to. So while it won't explicitly tell you, hey, student, do dx integration, and then on number four, do dy integration, it, every single question will tell you perpendicular to x-axis, or perpendicular to y-axis, and then you just have to figure out, okay, which one accordingly then do I have to do? Perpendicular to x is dx, perpendicular to y is dy. That's the first thing. What type of integration? Then, then I would figure out what are the limits of that integration going to be? If I have these, this region bounded in the plane, what's the left side, what's the right side? You need those values for your dx integral. So if I'm doing a dy, what's the bottom y value and what's the top y value of my region? I always need to know what the points of intersection are, or sometimes it's just the bound of your region. I need to know what are the what are the limits, what are my parameters for integration? Through what variables am I uh, accumulating all those slices for? And now here's kind of the, the key part where a lot of geometry is going to come into play. We have to get the area formula of one arbitrary slice. Arbitrary just means kind of random, chosen at random in the middle of my integral. I need to get the area formula of one slice. And typically, that area formula is going to start with the variable s. And s is the length of the slice. It's going to be the distance between the two points in my region. So that area is going to start in terms of s, but then we will either have to change it from s into x's for a dx integral or from s into y's for a dy integral. And we'll have to figure out how to do that, right? We'll need the algebra to make that happen. But I need the area of one slice, and then the last step, integrate the area to get the volume. Okay, And it could be a couple of different cross-sectional shapes. We'll kind of talk about the different options that we see frequently. Uh, but let's just jump into it. right? we got just one page of examples. It'll probably take, I don't know, I'm not even going to guess. It's probably going to take a decent amount of time. All right, here we go. So set up the integrals needed to find the volume of the solid whose base is the area bounded by the lines y equals x squared and y equals negative 2x plus 3. Then it says cross sections are, are going to be perpendicular. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I meant to change it to here. That's going to be perpendicular uh, to the x-axis. That means perpendicular to the x-axis. Okay, That means my slices are vertical. And if your slices are vertical, that means they're all really thin. So perpendicular to x, that means I'm going to be doing a dx integral. All right, so it tells me dx, not explicitly, but it tells me everything I know, I need to know. Let's go graph this region, right? So let's go graph it. Here we go. y equals x squared. Parabola. Pretty easy. And let's do the other one. Negative 2x plus 3. I don't know. So 1, 2, 3. It's going to be somewhere like this, and then a slope of negative 2. I don't know. It's more or less something like this. It does not have to be to scale, but the idea is I, I want to see kind of where my region is. Let's go find 
uh, these intersection points. So I'm going to need to know, since this is a dx integration, I need to know what's this number on the left and then what's this number on the right. So just like we did with the area, let's go set those things equal and find the intersection points. So if you have a calculator, graph them and find both, but a lot of these are going to end up being non-count questions. Let's move everything over to the left. I think that one's going to factor plus 3 minus 1. So then your solutions are going to be at negative 3 and 1. So this x value is negative 3, and that one's 1. My diagrams actually doesn't seem super terribly off, uh, but there we go. All right, so we've got our intersection points. So our dx integration we know is going to be from left to right, so it's going to be uh, an integration from negative 3 to 1. Uh, and now I, I pretty much just need to figure out what's, the cross, uh, what's that cross-sectional area going to be, and then I integrate the area to get the volume. Here we go, first one. Let's draw ourselves a little slice. And I'm just going to pick an arbitrary point kind of right here, right? I'm just going to draw this one arbitrary slice. And then I want to know, basically, what is this slice length? That, that little bracket didn't come out very well. Let's see if I can do it again. Uh, it kind of curves it a little bit. Uh, but, but I have that one arbitrary slice. You could do yours uh, closer to the left if you want, or you could do yours closer to the right. It really doesn't matter. It's arbitrary, right? You just kind of pick one in the middle, and then the length of that slice in the xy plane, that's going to begin as the variable s. Now I'm going to kind of blow that thing up over here. I right? kind of just imagine this thing over here, right? This is my length s. There's my s value, and it says, hey, for this particular slice, uh, it's going to end up being a rectangle with a height of 4. Right? So I have this rectangle, and it tells me the height of that rectangle is 4. So kind of imagine this little rectangle coming straight off the page. And then we'd want this slice with its rectangle, and then this one, right? Eventually, we would want all of the rectangles from all of those slices, and we'd want to compile them all from that slice all the way on the left, at x equals negative 3 all the way to that right one at x equals 1. But each one of those cross-sectional slices is going to be a rectangle, and I need to know what's the area of that rectangle. And it's going to start off with the variable s. But here we go. The base is s, and then the height that told us was fixed at 4, so that area is going to end up being 4s. Now, we're nearly done. I don't want to integrate 4s, though, because we want a dx integral. That means I need this to be in terms of x. So I'm going to need 4 times something. Right? And really that s, right? it's the length of that slice. It's the distance between those two uh, points, those two functions. s is going to be the top minus the bottom. <clears throat> if you're doing a dx integration, the s value, the length of the slice, the distance in between those two points, it's going to be top minus bottom again. That's for dx. Uh, oh, I said dx, and then I wrote dy. Uh, if you were doing a dy integration, uh, then the s value is going to be right minus left. It's just like what we did when we found the areas. Uh, we want the distance in between the two, and so it's either going to be top minus bottom for dx, or right minus left for dy. So that top curve was the linear function, negative 2x plus 3 minus the bottom which was x squared, right? That's my s value, top minus bottom. Uh, if you want to like rearrange it, you could. Uh, it's not really hugely important, uh, but, but now we're ready, right? The volume, I'm going to integrate the area. Well, here's the area, so I'm going to be integrating 4, and then if you want to, you can kind of rewrite it. I probably would. Negative x squared minus 2x plus 3. Now, a lot of the times, if I have a constant, like 4, a lot of the times I'll end up putting that 4 out in front. You don't have to. You can leave it inside of the integral if you want, but a lot of the times I'll bring it out to the front. And then the last thing that we need is, hey, what are the limits for that integral? Through what values are we going to accumulate all of these slices from? Well, we would start with this first one, then we get that one, then that one, right? And we somehow want to accumulate all these infinitely many areas from all these infinitely many slices from that left one at negative 3 all the way to the right one at x equals 1. Right? So x equals negative 3, that's the lower limit for the integration, uh, and then the x equals 1, that's the right. And then that's it. 
right? It doesn't even say to evaluate it. It just says set up the integral that would represent the volume. And there it is. Integrate the area to get the volume. We had to figure out what's the area of one little slice and then integrate that area to get the volume. Now let's look for this next one. Right, for this next one, it says uh, now those cross-sectional slices, they're going to be semicircles. So again, think about having this little slice length. Right, and that, that length on the bottom is S. But now it says that slice is going to end up being a semicircle. Right, just making it worse. Oh, well. Uh, so now we have those semicircular slices that we're going to want to accumulate. Right, and we're going to still accumulate them from negative 3 to 1. Right. But now I need the area formula of a semicircle, and it's going to start off in terms of S, and then, of course, we'll need to get it in terms of X. Okay, well, let's think. Here is the radius. Now we know the area of a full circle is pi r squared, so the area of a semicircle is going to be 1 half pi r squared. Here we go, 1 half pi. The radius here would not be S. The radius would be s over 2. Okay, so let's multiply this out. I've got 1 half pi, and I've got s squared over 4. So what is our area formula for this uh, semicircle going to be? Well, it's going to be we have an 8 on the bottom, we have a pi on the top. So it's going to be pi over 8 s squared. This, by the way, is something you're probably going to want to memorize. Is it that hard to prove it again if you, if you forget it? No, but the semicircles, they just come up enough that you're just going to want to remember. Semicircle is pi over 8 s squared. But again, we don't, we don't want to leave it with s. Again, we're going we're gonna to plug in that s value. So here we go. Let's get this one done. Volume. I'm going to take that constant, pi over 8. It's still going to be the negative 3 to the 1. And then it's going to be pi over 8 s squared. So I need that s value. Square it. This was a dx integral. And remember, the s value uh, was this. Negative x squared minus 2x plus 3. And that would be the answer. Uh, let's see what color. Okay, that works. That would be the answer. Now, if you were to math 9 these things, right, it didn't even want us to. It just said set up the integrals that would represent it. But if it wanted us to math 9 it, we could have. Now, really, that first one, we, we could do without a calculator. That's a pretty easy thing to integrate. 1 and negative 3 are pretty easy uh, say things to plug in. And then the, the 4, right, multiply by 4. Uh, the second one would be a little bit uglier. You'd have to FOIL it out first. Then we could integrate. And then we would have to leave the answer in terms of pi. Uh, so if we really desired to do it by hand, we probably could. This one would end up being 128 over 3. Uh, and then the other one, which we just did, the one with the semicircle, uh, it actually ends up being, let's see, 64 pi over uh, 15. And so, like, if you wanted to have the exact solutions, if you had to actually do it by hand, you could get the exact solutions. Or if you, if you want, the calculator can give you the decimal. This would be 42.6 repeating. And then the other one, uh, let's see, if you change that to the decimal, it is 13.404. Okay, but a lot of the times these volume questions are not going to actually have you compute what the volume is. A lot of the times it's going to be write the integral that would represent the volume, and it won't actually make you do it. Because setting it up is, is kind of enough work on its own. Then actually going through and doing the integral sometimes would be a little bit troublesome. Sometimes it's easier, and it really depends on what that area formula was. But there we have it. First two examples. Get the area formula of one slice. And that slice is going to start off uh, with an area based on S, which is that edge length, that length of the slice in the plane, in that region. It's going to start off in terms of S, but if they have a dx integral, I'm going to need to change it from S into something with Xs, so top minus bottom. Or if we're going to be doing a dy integration, which we'll see uh, in, in a little bit, uh, we're going to want to change it from s into something with y's, which is going to be the right curve minus left curve. But I integrate the area to get the volume. That's the whole idea behind today. All right, let's move it on. Here we go. It says set up the integrals needed to find the volume of the solid. I don't know why that's plural. It's, there's just only going to be one. 
Uh, but here we go. Let's graph it. It says, uh, find the volume of the solid whose base is the area bounded by the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 9, and whose cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are equilateral triangles. And, and there we have it, right? There's our formula for the equilateral triangle, just like how we had the, the pi over 8 s squared for the semicircle, the root 3 over 4 s squared for the equilateral triangle. That's another one you're going to want to remember. Ooh, sorry, I had to sneeze, and I thought it would be nicer if I paused the video. Uh, anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna go prove this formula for you, just so if you forget it, you can you can kind of remember how to do it again. But the root three over four is it's just gonna be something that you would probably want to remember. Okay, so here we go. If I have an equilateral triangle, that means all the sides are the same. That bottom slice is S, so the other two are also S. Now, really, what we'd want to do is drop this altitude. Uh, remember, for, for an equilateral triangle, all of those angles would have been 60. But if I drop the, the uh, attitude, uh, if I drop the altitude, now I've got a 60, 30, 90 special right triangle, and we have this relationship. Uh, whenever I have a 30, 60, 90 special right triangle, so there's the 30, there's the 60. Typically, the shorter leg is written as x, the longer leg is, or the hypotenuse is 2x. And then this is going to be x roots of 3. That's something that you should know from geometry. Okay, and it's it's really just Pythagorean theorem and, and Shokotoa trigonometry if you have to reprove it. But uh, but that's a special right triangle that you should remember. Uh, we also have uh, the 45, 45, 90, and that one's x, x, x root of 2. Okay, so those are your two special right triangles from geometry. The 45, 45, 90, where the, the two base legs right, are congruent, it's isosceles, and then you just multiply that base length by the root of 2 to get the hypotenuse. Uh, and then here, if I have the base length, I would multiply by 2 to get the hypotenuse, uh, and then I would multiply by the root of 3. Root of 3 is less than 2. Remember, the hypotenuse has to be the biggest side. Uh, so, so multiply by the root of 3, which is about 1.7, I think, 1.7-ish. Uh, X root of 3 is the longer leg. But there's our rule. Uh, so let's think. Here is the hypotenuse. And so if I'm going uh, from, oh, I didn't want to do that. Oh, well. If I'm going from the hypotenuse to the shorter leg, it's going to divide it by 2. And you can also just think, okay, if that whole bottom side is S, then half of it is S over 2. And that means to go from this leg to the, to the altitude, it's going to be S over 2 times the root of 3. And then we could go ahead and start bringing this stuff together. We know the area of a triangle is one-half base times height. The base is S. The height is root 3 over 2S. And so what are we going to end up getting? We have 2 times 2, so we have 4 on the bottom. The root of 3, come on, smart board, goodness gracious. So we have the root of 3, and then we have S squared. So there's your area formula for the equilateral triangle, right? Just for this context, uh, whenever we're having these cross-sectional things, right? And, and S is the length of the slice. The root three over four, that's our equilateral triangles. Pi over eight, S squared is your semicircle. Root three over four, S squared, that's your equilateral triangles. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of these different cross-sectional shapes we could have, uh, but those two, the equilateral triangles and the, and the, and the uh, semicircles, those come up quite a bit. All right, so let's go for it. We got this circle. By the way, the radius of that circle is 3. So that comes 3 units to the right. That's 3 units to the left. That's 3 units up. That's 3 units down. Okay, my, I just kind of did the circle fast, but there we have it, right? Uh, and now, let's think about it. It says our slices are going to end up being uh, perpendicular to the x-axis. So I'm just going to draw like one arbitrary slice. And what's, what's interesting here is that uh, that slice, the circle, is the top and the bottom. And so we know, we know the S is typically top minus bottom, right, for a dx integral. It's the distance between at those two points. But you're like, okay, Mr. Bell, the circle's on the top, the circle's on the bottom. So if I did the circle minus the circle, does that equal zero? Well, think about it. Is, is the distance between those two points zero? No. Uh, no, very much no. Uh, so we have to kind of actually take this curve, and we're going to split it up. Let's solve this, right? We have 
x squared plus y squared equals 9. Let's solve it for y. Uh, so we could subtract uh, the x squared over, and then I could have plus or minus the square root 9 minus x squared. Right? That's the full circle, plus or minus uh, the square root of 9 minus x squared. That's the full circle. y equals the positive, right? the positive root. That's going to end up being the top part of the circle. Uh, and then the y equals the negative root. That's the bottom part. Plus or minus is the full circle. But, but if I really have that same curve that's on the top and the bottom, I don't want to do, hey, that curve minus itself is zero. Really what I would need to do is the top part of the curve, which is the positive radical, and then I would minus the bottom part of the curve, which is the negative radical. And then what ends up happening to those two negatives? Well, they're going to end up canceling. And here this s value is going to end up being two of the radicals. And, and if you remember back last time when we did the area between two graphs, like if we have uh, something like this, where sometimes the parabola is the same curve on top and bottom, or if I have, I don't know, something like this, where the parabola is the same thing on the right and the left, it would be this same type of a setup. If I have a curve that's both the right side and the left side, what you'd have to do is take the positive root, and then you'd have to take the negative root, and then that distance in between the two, it would be the positive root minus the negative root, and so it's going to end up being two of the roots. That's the same thing, whether it's a dx integral or whether it's a dy, right? Here you'd have the positive side, here you'd have the negative side, and so that distance in between the two right here, you would have the positive minus the negative. So again, it's usually going to end up looking like two of the roots. We generally try to avoid having the same curve being the right and the left side at the same time. Right? If that comes up, we would probably try to avoid the dy integration. Or we, we try to avoid it when the same curve is both the top and the bottom. So, so we would probably not have done the dx integral for that. Uh, but we could. We pretty much always could. But if the same curve is the top and the bottom, we have to remember that, that that length of the slice, the distance in between those two curves, even if it's the same curve, the distance isn't zero. The distance is the positive part of the curve minus the negative part of the curve. And so it usually ends up being something like two radicals or two uh, like uh, cube roots, or not cube roots, I guess it would be a quartic root, uh, but so on and so forth. You have the positive root minus the negative root, and so it's going to usually always end up being two of the roots. And that's the same strategy you would do for areas and for later on if we saw volumes. Anytime one function or one curve, one graph, if it's both the top and the bottom, or if it's both the right and the left, uh, you just have to think, what's the positive part minus the negative part? And that will give us that distance in between the two. Okay, so here we go. This is my S value. And then we just got our S value, right? It was the top minus the bottom. Now we know the area formula, so we're ready to go, right? Here we go, the volume. Uh, we're going to have the root 3 over 4, and then it was S squared. This was a dx integral. I'm going to plug in the s value. So I've got two of the roots, 9 minus x squared. And then I just need the limits for the interval. I need to compile all of these slices, starting with that left one at negative 3, and then all the way to that right one. Right? In the dx integration, you're going to integrate from the left to the right. And so there we have it. That would be the answer uh, to this question. That would be the integral that would represent the volume. Now that one could actually be cleaned up a little bit. Let me kind of get rid of some of this. Okay, so we could actually take that sucker and we could make it look a little bit prettier, right? If we took this and we squared it, let's see, we'd have the root three over four, and then we'd have four, and then nine minus x squared. And then really the fours would cancel. So you could also have seen this written as just 9 minus x squared with the root of 3. Like this would be the same thing, as that this is just kind of like the prettier version of it. And you know what's also kind of a little bit cool? Uh, you, you, you could have this reduced, kind of simplified, prettier version, which, by the way, this would now be very easy to do. Right? That's a super easy integral. Plugging in the 3 and the negative 3 would be easy. And what you could also do is, hey, instead of doing the whole region, uh, you could think about symmetry. 
if I just chose to do like half of it, if I just did zero to three, uh, I could then double it. Because of symmetry, if I just integrate and I find half, and I find all those cross-sectional slices, multiplying it by two is going to get the other side. Right? So this, this really could look a couple different ways. Like that way is fine. That's kind of like the, the straight up plug it into the formula. Don't reduce anything. Leave it as root 3 over 4 s squared. Plug in your s though. Uh, or I could have expanded it, right? 2 squared is 4. And so really that and that ends up canceling. Uh, or you could use symmetry and instead of doing all the way to the left to all the way to the right, you could go from zero to the right. Or you could have done from negative three to zero, right? Either way, you could have done half of it and then just put that two out in front to double. All those would be perfectly fine. And then if you math nined it, uh, which, which, I mean, you could get the answer in terms of the root of three, but in order to get the final decimal, you would probably need to math nine it or use the calculator. This would end up being 62.5. Three, five, four. The question didn't even ask us for it, right? It just wanted the integral setup. We gave you like three different integrals, four different integrals. Uh, but if you have to actually spit it out, you will generally have a calculator. All right, here we go. I think we got just the last one and then we're done. <clears throat> All right, here we go. It says the base of a solid bounded by y equals x squared. I'm going to graph it equals x squared. Here we go. And then we've got uh, y equals 0. Okay, that's easy, aka the x-axis. And then we've got x equals 2. Uh, so let's see, like 1, 2. Mm, okay, pretty, pretty close. x equals 2. Let's just continue that sucker. There we go. x equals 2. Uh, so there's my region, right? It's that kind of triangular-ish shape. Uh, it says that's the base of my region, and it says for each or for this solid, each cross section is going to be perpendicular. Sorry, that says I got kind of got crossed off. It's perpendicular to the y-axis. Where your y-axis is vertical, right? Here's your y-axis. Perpendicular to it means I'm going to have a horizontal slice. So perpendicular to the y-axis, this is going to end up meaning we need a dy integration. I'm going to need these little horizontal arbitrary slices. Right, and now that S value, let me switch it back over to the black, the S value, instead of it being top minus bottom, now the S, which is the length of the slice, that's going to be right minus left. Okay, so here we go. First thing I'm going to do, uh, I know the right one, that was just X equals 2. That was nice. Let's go get the left one. The left was Y equals X squared. So therefore, X is going to be plus or minus the root of Y. Now, uh, the positive side would be the right, the negative side would be the left. I only need the right. So really, I just need x equals the root of y. So I've got the right side, which is x equals 2. The left side, which is x equals the root of y. I don't really care about the negative root, the negative side of the parabola. And then we're going to be integrating from this bottom slice, which is at y equals 0, all the way up to this top slice. So I'm going to need to know where those things intersect because I'll be integrating to accumulate all those slices, starting with this first one at y equals 0, and then all the way up to this top one, which I need to find what that intersection point is. Okay, it's really easy. Like, where do these two things intersect? If x is 2 and, and, and the function is x squared, uh, well, then that coordinate point, that's the point 2, 4. So that upper limit is going to be y equals 4. Okay, so let's go for it. It says, each of those cross-sectional shapes is going to be a square. It's kind of covered by all my scribbling now, uh, but it says each of those cross-sectional shapes are going to be a square. So we've got this one slice, and we're going to have a square cross-section built off of it. Right? So kind of just imagine that sucker being blown up. Here's those two points. That's your S value. Since it's a square, all of the other sides are S, and that's really easy because the area of a square is just S squared. And here the S value is right minus left, right? So here we go. We're going to have the right curve, which was 2, minus the left curve, which is the root of Y. So there's my area formula. And then the last thing, in order to get the volume, we're going to integrate the area. We're integrating it from 0 up to 4. And then it was 2 minus the root of Y squared. And there we'd have it. That's the integral that would represent the volume. Could I do it by hand? Yeah, it would be a little ugly. We'd have to foil it out first 
and then we'd have to integrate, and then we would probably have some, some uglier numbers. It actually ends up being pretty nice. The very final singular answer ends up being eight thirds. You can math nine it if it ever actually wants you to find the volume. Most of the times though, especially if it's non-calculator. If it's non-calculator, you're probably just gonna have to set up the integral. If you have a calculator, be warned, you may have to math nine it at the end, but they typically don't ever make you work these out by hand because it's just too long, right? It's too long, it's a little bit mean if they actually make you do it by hand. non cal they're just gonna have you set it up, and then the calculator, they will probably still just make you set it up, but if you have a calculator, they may make you math nine at the end. And, and if you can math nine it with the dy integration also, it doesn't matter. All right, let's just quickly uh, kind of think about all of the different cross-sectional slices, right, and, and what they could potentially throw at you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get you guys out of here. Okay, let me actually, let me get rid of this right now. Let me move that sucker, and then here we go. Okay, so the common cross-sectional slices. Uh, well, we could have a square. We just saw that example, right? And that one's pretty easy. <clears throat> the area of a square is S squared. Uh, and we could see rectangles. We saw them. Now, there's really two different types of rectangles. We saw one that had a fixed height. Like the example we saw said, hey, like we have a height of four. So we have this S value on the bottom, and there it says the, the height was just fixed. Okay, so then it was just 4S. Or if the, the height was 7, then it would be 7S. Uh, a rectangle with a fixed height is, is pretty easy. Right? It's just that number times S. But you could also see a rectangle with a variable height. And it'll say something like, hey, okay, the height is going to be 1 half of the width. Or it could be the height... Uh, height is three times the width. Uh, so you could see something like this. Okay, if that's my width, right, if that's my width S, then this height could be uh, one half of S. Or uh, if we have the S value, if it's three times, uh, well, there we'd have it. But either way, like this would be uh, S times S and then one half, so that would be one half S squared. Or this would be three S times S with the three, so that would be a three S squared. Whether it's a fixed height, or whether the height is kind of based on the width. Could be one half, could be three times, could be ten, like it doesn't matter. It could be a fixed height or a variable height. Either way, rectangles should be pretty easy. Right? They're pretty easy for us. Uh, it really doesn't matter if it's a fixed height or a variable height. Okay, other shapes that we see. Uh, we, we saw the equilateral triangles. Equilateral triangles. And remember that one. We could reprove it, but you probably don't want to have to. It's root 3 over 4, S squared. That one comes up quite a bit. Uh, you have the semicircular ones, semicircles. That one is pi over 8, S squared. I would definitely put stars next to those two because those are the ones that come up quite a bit. All the other ones, like rectangles and squares, like those come up, but they're so easy, you really don't have to worry about them. But the equilateral triangles and the semicircles, those are the weird ones that come up. So I would definitely have you guys try to memorize those. Root 3 over 4, S squared, and then the pi over 8, S squared. Those ones come up quite a bit. Uh, you could see other types of triangles, though. Uh, like maybe we see uh, a right triangle, and, and you could have it like this. Like let's say here's your S, and there's your H. And again, it could have a fixed height, uh, and it could be something like, okay, the height is 4. So I'd have 1 half uh, base times height, and so that area would just end up being, what, 2S. The fixed height triangle, if it's a right triangle, uh, that's just going to be one half of the fixed height rectangle. Duh. Uh, but we could also have the variable height. Ooh, variable height. Right? We could have something like the height is going to be uh, four times the width. So uh, whenever we have this thing, right, if this is my S, that could be 4S. Then my area would be one half base times height. So then I'd have 2S squared. We could have, just like rectangles, we could have the right triangles that either have a fixed height or have a variable height. And that, that really shouldn't matter because it's just half of a rectangle. And if we can do rectangles, we should be able to do the right triangles. Uh, you could see uh, an isosceles right triangle, right? Let's say it does something like this. 
Uh, what if I've got that 45, 45? Well, that's easy. If that's S and that's S, the area is just going to be one half S squared. That's half of a square. Right? So that would be a, an isosceles uh, right triangle. Uh, and that's, that's an isosceles right triangle where one of the legs is the base. You could also potentially see something like this, where the S value, if that's your 45, 45, 90, that was a terrible 90 degree angle. Uh, it could happen that the S is, uh, is there, I don't like that. I'm going to fix it because that's ugly. I didn't know, it's just bothering me. Okay, so if we have uh, the S value, right, so, so well, that was still pretty bad. Uh, if this was our 45, 45, I had some like that isosceles right triangle the 45, but now the hypotenuse is the edge in that plane, is that length of the plane. Well, you'd have to remember that rule. Remember the rule from geometry is x, x, x root of 2. So to go from the leg to the hypotenuse, you multiply by the root of 2. That means to go in reverse, you would divide by the root of 2. Uh, and so this would be like s over uh, s over the root of 2, and then you could do that times that, which is also s over the root of 2. You could also then try to use your, your rules and try to figure out, okay, well, that's, that's s over 2, and then use your uh, s over 2, right, whatever. Uh, I guess it would be s over, over 2, and then times your root of 3. Uh, you could see stuff like that, but really they don't, right? The, the triangles you're going to see are probably going to be fixed height or probably going to be variable height. Uh, it could potentially be that half of a square situation. If you have the hypotenuse that's in the plane, they will probably just give you the area formula. But technically, they don't have to, right? We've all got geometry credit, so we should be able to. Uh, but yeah, those are those are kind of the common ones. We have the squares, the rectangles that are fixed, or the rectangles that are variable height. We could have the, the right triangles that are fixed height or variable height. Uh, we could have the equilateral triangles. We could have the semicircle. Let's do one more. Uh, let's do a one more. How about a quarter circle? quarter circle would look like this, where here's your length of the, uh, of the slice. And really here, the radius is S. So this one would just be like one-fourth, uh, one-fourth, oh my gosh, I'm struggling today, one-fourth pi r squared, right? And that one would actually be, the semicircle is not pi over 2, because the radius, right, for that semicircle, the radius was S over 2, right? So that kind of messes with it. That's why it ends up being a, a pi over 8. For the quarter circle, you don't need to use the radius as s over 4. The radius just is s because that whole kind of line segment that goes all the way, that actually is the radius. But for the, the, the semicircles, that is actually the diameter. So you have to work a little bit harder. But those are some of the common ones. Uh, we have the different squares, the rectangles, the right triangles. The, the weird ones that you probably want to remember, again, equilateral triangles, and then the semicircles, the root 3 over 4 s squared, and then the pi over 8 s squared. Those are the ones that are the most common. Could there be other weirder shapes? Yes, but generally, if it's anything weirder than any of those, they will probably just give you the formula. But any of those are fair game, and you should really know or be able to prove what that area formula is. And once you find the area, get it in terms of x or in terms of y, and then remember the whole idea. Integrate the area to get the volume.